leads me into this topic of, of practical application with working with forgiveness, and that, I would say, once you start to work with the context of the text, and you start to realize that it's a perceptual problem, and you start to realize that the only way out of this perceptual problem is, is first you have to see the problem exactly as it is, and not as it was made up to be. So for example, like in 12-step programs, you know, a lot of the beginning parts of the 12 steps is to start to first acknowledge the problem. If you're in a state of denial, and for example, someone who's an alcoholic, and they say, I've got no problem, no problem, no problem whatsoever, I like to drink, and I've got no problems. And people say, well, what about your behaviors? No, that's just the way I am, I've got no problems, I'm telling you. If you're in a state of denial, you're not going to take a road towards healing, you know, because it's almost like you're trying to live with the problem <laughs> and accept the problem as just the way things are. And that's not, you're not going to go anywhere. So the first thing I would say is there has to be a, an acknowledgement of that there's some kind of an error or, or a problem or a mistake that needs to be corrected. And more than that, I would say the second thing is, is it's a convincing job from the Holy Spirit to show the sleeping mind that it has a perceptual problem. You know, we, when you're sleeping and you think of yourself as a human being, you have got, oh, I've got relationship problems, I've got drug addiction problems, or I've got financial problems, or so on and so forth. You, you think the problems are all specific, but you don't really realize yet that you're just misperceiving the world. So like in, uh, the way they go about this in 12-step groups is they, they'll go around the room and they'll have everybody announce their name. Hi, I'm so-and-so, and, -so, and I, I'm an alcoholic, or I'm a drug addict, or whatever. You know, they'll have them acknowledge that there is something that they're showing up for to be healed from. And that's like an almost acknowledgement that there's a problem that needs to be solved. It would be the same if, if you had a, a child who was learning things and it was a genius and they, they started to feel very confident and cocky, but if, they, if there was no sense of a problem, then, then they wouldn't really have any motive you know, to, to go forward. You would think that if you would reach a state of bliss and peace and contentedness, your motivation for, for problem solving would disappear but you would also see that if you're in a state of denial and you're not acknowledging the problem, that you don't have a motivation to heal. So what I say is, 12-step groups, they go around and they say, hi, my name's so-and-so and I have a, I'm an alcoholic or so forth. I would say that it's good to start off with Course in Miracle groups, for example, and say, hi, my name's so-and-so and I have a perceptual problem. You know, you could, everybody could do You could start every Course in Miracles group out, and that would be a good way to start the group. You come in, you hug, you greet each other, you sit down, you get your blue books ready. Hi, my name is so-and-so, give your name, and I have a perceptual problem. And what that would do, it would, it would take you back more and more closer to square one, where you start to realize that, that the problems aren't even set up in a way to clearly be solved when they're seen as so specific. But if you're seeing the world in, through a distorted lens, and that's your one problem that has to be solved, it would be helpful to acknowledge that. And that's what A Course in Miracles does. It takes you first, first step in forgiveness is you've got to be able to acknowledge that there's something that needs correction. There's, there's something, and that something is the mind. Not the human being, not all the things that are tied in with the human being, it's the mind that's asleep and dreaming. So people sometimes will say, well, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I can remember that. It's hard to, I, I, think, I think I'm seeing the world and I think it's, it's pretty good. I mean, I, I can't really acknowledge that it's a perceptual problem. But in psychology we have, we have names for these things. Like, I studied psychology, so what would you say if you were perceiving something uh, that wasn't there. Hallucination. Hallucination. So that's part of delusions and hallucinations. That, that would be a psychological or a psychiatric term. If you're perceiving something that's not even there at all, you're hallucinating or you have delusions. Um, 
So, what would you say, what would we say if we, somebody was diagnosed of hearing multiple voices, many voices in their mind? Schizophrenia. So we're, we're starting to define the human condition in different terms. Not the ones that are locked up in the institutes. We're talking with the regular people. <laughs> Even the successful people. Okay, hallucinating, schizophrenic. And what do we call it in psychology and psychiatry when you have a total and complete break from reality? Psychosis. Psychosis. So, I'm, hi, my name's so-and-so. I have a perceptual problem, I'm hallucinating, I'm psychotic, I'm schizophrenic. Now we're talking. Now you've, you're starting to get to the point where you need some help. <laughs> but you see, it first takes an admission. If you already think you're a fully functioning human being who's, who's lucky and, and fortunate, more fortunate than those other unfortunate, dysfunctional human beings, however many millions or billions you want to put in that category, you see, you already feel like you're in an advantage. And, well, you get a few annoyances and irritations and a few aches and pains, but basically, I, I've got it better off than the rest of those poor schmucks over there. You're not going anywhere on your spiritual journey until you start to get the context of, oh, wait a minute, I've, I've got a perceptual problem, I'm hallucinating, I'm psychotic, and I'm schizophrenic. Now you've got some impetus for healing when you start to come there. And you see how important that is in the forgiveness process because until you start to acknowledge what's going on, it's like you you don't have a motivation for, for healing. Then, once you start to acknowledge that, then you start to realize that there's something under the surface, more than meets the eye, there's something under the surface that, that is off and it's, it's unconscious, that you're not even fully aware of this ego belief system that is driving the puppet. And that's, that's a very uncomfortable feeling at the beginning, like, uh-oh, am I like a pawn? Am I like a pawn or a, just a puppet in some bigger, dastardly scheme of darkness and separation? You know, that doesn't feel good either. They don't teach you this in the empowerment workshops. <laughs> that you're, you're sitting on like a keg of dynamite. You've got all these unconscious beliefs that are di dictating how your life goes. You know, dictating the script. That's, that's not very comforting. And yet that's important to acknowledge that I need to raise into awareness that which I am unaware of. That which I have denied and repressed. Maybe it's even memories of sexual abuse or really dark kind of events, we'll say more interpretations of events, because it's always the interpretation is where the darkness comes in. So bringing that, let the darkness come to the light, that's very much the impetus behind our two guidelines, no people pleasing, no private thoughts. We want that unconscious stuff to come to the surface so it can be released as quickly as possible. Why stay in prison and have it locked away when you can, you've got the key, you can open the door and let some of that stuff up. And then finally, after, after you've acknowledged it, after you've exposed it, and you've let it come, come up, is really giving it over to the Holy Spirit. And immediately it is sh shined away. It's not like the Holy Spirit has to like do magic or do a process on it. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of like those bug zappers. As soon as the bug <laughs> hits the electricity, it's not like the bug tries to fight, fight the electricity. No, I will not yield. I will not surrender. No, it's zap. <laughs> it's just a plain zap. I mean, when the bug hits the electricity, it's zap. When your dark thoughts and attack thoughts come up and you give them over to the Holy Spirit, it's zap. And they are gone, never to return again. And if you have more unconscious beliefs that have to come up, they're going to have to come up and there'll be more zapping. But we'll go on. Good. That's, that's uh, Frances's pathway to God. She calls it zap. <laughs> she likes that zap word. Every time she tries to get out of alignment with God's will, zap, zap, zap. So it's, it's a good thing. It keeps her on the pathway. Now, the other aspect of that is 
I find in all these years, once I came into this experience of all this joy, I want to make these tools and processes available to everyone in a language they can understand. So that's been part of my work has been developing like, I have this one worksheet online called Instrument for Peace, where you can start by writing out some of you, a few of you bought that book, uh, Awakening Through a Course in Miracles. It's in, it's in that book too, it's in, in the back of that book. But it's also online. Actually, everything I've been sharing for all these years, it's all online. Uh, it's, uh, just about everything I can think of, is, it's all there. You just have to dig for it. So finally people said, can't you make books and CDs and DVDs? And because we, we, you know, we like to read books and said, okay, we'll do that too. But it's all there for free online. But but this instrument for peace starts you off with what you perceive to be the problems on the surface of consciousness, and then it takes you down into this decision-making process that's going on in your mind. So you start off with what you perceive, you start off with what you're feeling, you might be angry, guilty, about a particular scene or scenario, and it could relate to something in the past or the future. You'll never have an issue with the present moment. <laughs> In fact, none of us have any issues right now. It's always, they're always remembered or anticipated. We're really free right now, but if we choose to dredge up the past and project off a future, that's where it gets difficult. So there's a lot of tools online, like the Instrument for Peace, that can help you, 12 steps that take you, guide you along of whatever perception you have, and then take you down to a point of release, which is a point of decision. Pretty much kind of like, would I rather be right or happy? You know, would I rather be right about the way the ego set this up? Or surrender that to the Holy Spirit and be happy? You know, it's really, that's like the core decision. So, I did a lot of traveling in all these countries and teaching these things, and then they started filming me and putting things together. And so, for those that, uh, maybe the Course seems like a, it's, it's a, it's, it's a great practice, but it's a lot of words, and you really have to give yourself over to it. We developed an online mind training program that people can do at any hour of the day, in any part of the world, wherever they have internet connection. And it's called MMT, Mystical Mind Training. And it's audio-visual. It's got meditations, it's got, you have a mind training partner that is vibrationally connected to you, and going through the same issues you're going through at the same time. And you get paired up that way, so you have a mind training partner and also a lot of movies, movie clips, movies, a lot of stuff that people enjoy. Like the Movie Watcher's Guide, it's packed into this program. And I know my friend Lila, when she did the first module, I think, she had such a revelatory experience that she was laid out on the floor. Somebody had to come and get her. because she was wiped out in love uh, from the first module. I don't know how many modules there are now. I think they just developed the counseling module and keep the, yeah, they, they had 12 but they're adding to it and this and that. So that's another tool that we have online and that that's something that you can kind of give your mind over to. It, it's very interactive, you know, with movies and it asks you questions and you, you have little assignments and you have a mind training partner so that's helpful. Um, those are some of the kind of tools. I would say more with the YouTubes and a lot of the teachings, audio teachings that I've put online over the years, hundreds and hundreds, I'd say probably now we're up to thousands and thousands of hours of, of teaching materials collected over these last 20 some years. Um, but some of the tools are much more specifically designed, you know, to, to tap into and to work with in an interactive way. I mean, some of you may do that even with the YouTubes. You, you can play them, you can stop them, you can go, what was that? <laughs> i got to re rewind and play that one again. You can do that and make it very interactive. There are just a number of tools that, that we've designed that are all part of the forgiveness process and all help make it more meaningful and make it more rich. And it's just a matter of engaging in those and taking advantage. Do you have any that were particularly helpful for you that you've used? share like I feel it's you know whatever that's conscious 
unconscious will be projected out. So everything that we see outside is something that we haven't really faced in our unconscious mind. And I feel like um, at a certain point, I realized, you know, I was, I, I pray for a happy day, or but it's still in my mind there is a concept of what happiness should look like, and I still chase those concept and I've tried to avoid certain emotions that comes up. I don't want to face those emotions. I go for happiness. So really, I then it just came to me one day that I don't want to even tell myself that I want to look for happiness. I want to um, have experience where ancient hatred turned to present love. When the ancient hatred is in me, has always been in the mind, that I have never really been able to look at. So it's like embracing of whatever that comes up during the day that is given by the spirit that's ready for the mind to look at. Then when that, that I don't have to dig for that those kind of things, it comes. And when it comes, I really want to embrace it and see, okay, this is an opportunity that I can be free from it forever, f true freedom. And so I will give myself permission to acknowledge whatever that comes up through maybe journaling about it off the surface. You know, that's the story that I believe in that's caused the, these emotions. That's the interpretation I give. That's the grievance that I have. And, and also in the community, we have a really safe environment where we, we talk about it. Um, where people don't join us in the story, they 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 hold this space, and you know the course called true empathy, because really, when we hold on to guilt and being a victim, it really feeds the self concept. So underneath it, we really want those being a victim and the pain and the guilt, because it feeds our self concept and get us to be away from love. So when people actually join us in the story, it's sort of harder for people to let go of those stories and, and, and guilt, because just keep strength, strengthening the victim self-concept. So we don't really, we practice true empathy, and for myself, I want to give myself true empathy too. So when those, I seem to believe a certain um, upset or story interpretation, I allow that to come out, and. I will look at it and I will let go straight away. I don't want to keep telling myself in my mind, you know, again and again, this is what happened to me, this is someone said this. I just say, okay, this is what I believe and I truly want to be wrong. I truly want to be wrong. You convince me that I'm wrong about this. Give me an experience. Give me an experience that this will turn to present love, whatever this is. So it just, it is like to me is, Look at it, face it, and let it go as quickly as I can. The story of it, the interpretation of it, let it go as quickly as I can. And um, yeah, and I, I lately we also talk about it in the community. Is yeah, I have the experience after I talk about the thing so much, I realize I have the same story with whatever come up, I have the same story. And it's not even me, everybody has the same story. So sometimes I would just talk about it and in the middle of the sentence, <laughs> I don't even believe this anymore. I don't believe my story. <laughs> I would just drop it because I don't really believe it. So that allows, that gives space for something deeper to come up if we let go of what we think that is a cause. But also, we started to, um, in the community now, we started to really come um, enter this collaboration vibe where there is, if there is something that comes up between seemingly two people, um, I started to feel this is, must be a reason, it's a, like, almost like a prompt for me to join with this person in collaboration, in the spirit of collaboration, to join in the mind. Uh, instead of projecting something out, you know, it's for me to to join, to extend. The opposite of projecting is to extend, extend the spirit, extend the love out. Also. At one time when I visited the monastery to do a session this year, 
I started talking about relationships and there were these three words that were coming to me about relationships and um, that were so healing. It's really the direction where our perceptions of relationships are heading. As we go from specialness to holiness, we go higher and higher and we perceive relationships in a whole different light than we had before. And that's a major shift, you know, because there's so many hurts and grievances and projections that are tied down to those relationships that when we can lift, be lifted up from that, we're truly home free. We really feel the grace of God pouring through us. And these three kind of characteristics or words that came relationships were, the first one was undefined, that to the extent that we cling to the roles and the old patterns and definitions of the relationship, that we block the light of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is taking us to a whole different interpretation of the relationship. And when we cling to these rigid, limited beliefs about the relationship, then that holds us back from the higher realms. So the first one was undefined. The second one was guided, that of course, if the, the whole point of the course is to get in touch with our internal teacher, and our internal teacher knows the way out of the maze, then we have to give our relationships over to the Holy Spirit and say, guide me. You tell me how to proceed here. You tell me how to move forward. If I'm going to have to take steps, I'm going to need to know those steps. I need practical steps that I can actually listen to and follow that will take me to a higher perception of the relationship. In fact, um, there's one part in The Course in Miracles where Jesus is talking about the body and the, and the use of the best use of the body. And he says, you can use the body to expand your perception. Isn't that lovely? That's the use of a body, to expand perception. And the ego can come up with a lot of other ways to use a body in this world, which we could say would be misuse of a body because it's, it's keeping our perception constricted and limited. We want to expand our perception of the whole world, including the body, so to allow it to be used that way. I think movies are a great, great way to do that. There's a bunch of bodies, you are inspired by the Spirit. The Spirit says, watch this movie and look for these lessons. Wow, great, that's a lot different than entertainment. That's a way of using the body or the bodies to expand perception. Some of you have heard of Spiritual Cinema Network or Spiritual Cinema Circle, the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. We have there, we're working on an online Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment where you can actually have me sharing some commentary on the movies to set them up and insights afterwards. So it's slowly, more tools are evolving, but that's beautiful too. So, and then the third thing undefined, guided. The last one is collaborative, collaboration. When we really open up to collaboration, that's really what the joining is about. That's really what we want in all of our relationships. We want them to be collaborative, not adversarial, not competitive, not I'll, I'll do this and I'll, I'll get there first or I'll beat you at this or that. We want them to be joining and collaborative and I am just so inspired by collaboration that I'm always opening to collaborate wherever I go in the world. And uh, this past, uh, I think it was Christmas time, past December, they had this, uh, remember George Harrison of the Beatles? One of the four Beatles, they did a kind of a, a movie, a uh, documentary of his life called Living in the Material World and it was on HBO. And I, I, I did a whole session, streaming session with it, an online session, because to me it was a great example of, of someone who truly was called into the Spirit through his music, through his life, through his collaborations. And he was not discriminating in his collaborations. I mean, George Harrison was collaborating all over the place. Not just a musician collaborating and jamming with another musician. He did plenty of that too, certainly with the Beatles. But he was collaborating with Monty Python. He was collaborating in, with comedy. He was collaborating with, uh, one of his friends was Jackie Stewart, a Formula One race car driver. He's, 
he had a great friendship there. You see his circle of friends. Um, is it Ravi, Ravi Shankar, the, the musician and spiritual teacher, India, going to trips to India. Just a beautiful example of a life devoted to open-mindedness, to collaborating with people of all kinds of different cultures in many different aspects of, of the cultures and the world. To me, that just touches my heart. You know, that when I see somebody that's so open to collaboration, is it's so the opposite of competition. You know, I mean, even with the Olympics, the basis is competition, but but we have many, when you do watch the Olympics, you can see little signs and symbols uh, among the athletes and among those there of collaboration. And that's what stirs our heart. Not necessarily who wins the gold, who wins the silver and bronze. It's those moments of collaboration that really light us up. And in the Course in Miracles, Jesus says, miracles are collaborative. It's a, it's a collaborative venture. And that's again something that stirs us up, you know, when we come in there.